Mark Tillett is a co-founder and director of Hein Tillett Steel, or HTS for short, uh, their structural and civil engineering practice with a keen focus on innovative approaches to sustainable design. So Mark is a member of the NLA expert panel on zero carbon. So I wanted to ask him a bit about uh, the practice's interest in sustainability. And I'll start by asking you, Mark, uh, that Alec Gordon, when he was president of the RIBA in the early 70s, coined the phrase, long life, loose fit, which I know is something that uh, you use uh, a lot. So tell me how that's relevant today. Yeah, um, I, I think it's probably still the most relevant phrase there is to apply to sustainability. Um, it, it's a philosophy, uh, but I think the meaning of it and the application of it has changed in 50 years. And also um, how you apply it to the short, the medium, the long term is also uh, very different. Uh, for example, I think 50 years ago, the idea of long life loose fit was probably about demountable structures, which you could take down and rebuild uh, somewhere else. Now there's probably more focus on um, uh, deconstructability at the end of life, reusing elements in the circular economy, going away from abutments to fuller, but looking at not taking stuff to waste and landfill. Um, I also think about that the, the approach to uh, a loose fit building is not just focused on adding floors. That still is relevant. But what we've found in kind of extensive remodeling of buildings is often the most challenging stuff is recoring a building. Um, and this, I think, is driven again by a very changed occupier demand. 20, 30 years ago, people would sign up for 20 year leases and tenancies. Now, five years is the norm. And every 10 or 20 years, a building will probably change use or possibly change use. And this is accelerating over time. And whenever a building changes use, the core is in the wrong space. Uh, so, you know, recoring a building really is about the most aggressive thing you can do to the structure. Um, so I think in terms of uh, how do we apply it to buildings today, um, we, we've been looking at something um, which we've termed soft core, uh, which we've been trying to get developers uh, who are very keen to use it uh, on board with, which is a, a philosophy really connected with taking all the stability functions out of the core, which make it very aggressive to demolish, putting them into the facade, into the architecture of the facade, which normally has uh, lots of space to accommodate it, it's very efficient, and making the core a soft spot that you can punch in over the life of the building as, as the users uh, change and, um, uh, and demand uh, kind of requires. Um, I also think that the, the you know, long life loose fit was always a philosophy. And there's a problem at the moment. Lots of consultants are considering sustainability as a bolt-on service, uh, which should be provided with a fee. Uh, and I think this is completely wrong. It, it has to kind of run through everything we do. Um, it, it really is a mindset, and which needs to be with you throughout the whole project to, to apply it uh, truly creatively um, and make it work. Um, I think uh, another interesting thing is with, um, with new build, we need to learn from all of the eras of uh, successful buildings of the past, the 20s and 30s, which were steel frame, concrete floors primarily, uh, the 60s, 70s and 80s after the war, reinforced concrete, very heavy buildings on par foundations, and the 90s on beyond, probably steel intensive buildings are more common. Each of those eras of construction um, uh, the best buildings from each of those areas of construction have really lent themselves to remodeling into new guises. And it, it really, you know, the, the common themes are good bones, so good structure on a good grid, uh, and really some smart, passionate engineering early on in a project to, to make a building survive. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that's, that's some of the key bits. And there's also a, a real joy in, um, in a frugal, uh, efficient approach uh, to engineering, uh, the adaption and reuse, um, that, that's a real thrill for us as engineers uh, very often. Uh, and there's a beauty in the result of that. And I think if, if, the, if the team don't share that, uh, you're never gonna be truly sustainable. Um, and that needs to, as I say, it's not a bolt on service, it needs to run through everything we really do. Um, and I think my final point of this is, um, uh, I just thought of this uh, considering the interview earlier today about long life loose fit and how it is applicable to human beings um, as it is to buildings now, uh, especially through the, the whole pandemic and 
how loose our lives have become in terms of how we work and how we will work between the office and home going forward. Um, so, you know, the benefits are shared. Um, uh, there's lots of focus on low carbon, uh, but I think specifically in cities, the added benefits of reducing uh, construction waste and demolition are cleaner streets, uh, cleaner air, uh, less disruption, building stock returns to the market much quicker. Uh, and these are all going to help people lead longer, happier, healthier lives, hopefully, so on safer streets. Very good. But well, you, you also talk uh, about total engineering. Uh, can you tell me just what that is and how we can improve the way uh, that we build sustainably? Yeah. Um, so this is, a, this is kind of a, a philosophy that um, a, a phrase we borrowed from football, uh, but um, it, it's really based in the fact that only now uh, are we beginning to measure carbon uh, generally as an industry in very early stages, but it's typically measured uh, from everything you add to a building, all the permanent structure, architecture, and M&E, and then the operational uh, demand of that building. Uh, what we're saying is, you know, you need to measure everything. You need to measure from the point you start, uh, you, you strip out the building, the tenant leaves, um, throughout the entire life of the building, beyond practical completion, and so on and so forth. So the total engineering uh, approach from us is, um, again, it's a, it's a philosophy. It's a it's, it's kind of winding back the clock a bit to 20 or 30 years ago before all of the so much design was uh, franchised out to smaller, smaller firms and contracted design portions, bringing a lot of that back in house so that one per or as few minds as possible design the temporary works, the permanent works. It's one considered holistic approach of, of how you deliver a building and the efficiencies you can drive out of that are huge. I think the argument uh, we're making is that none of this pre that none of the uh, material required to get to a finished building is ever accounted for other than what exists on practical completion. So all of the temporary works associated with facade retention, everything which goes into to get into that point isn't measured. And there's often uh, as much embodied carbon in some uh, facade retention schemes as there is in the final structure. So all of this stuff can also be used for planning arguments, um, you know, a, a, a balanced against um, a perceived retention of historic streetscape against the true carbon cost of keeping that facade there. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it's, it's really um, a mindset. And I think we need to change the way as well that we approach projects. So traditionally, uh, a client goes to an architect and then shortly afterwards, a team's put together and the proposal is, is quite often on the table at that point. I think there needs to be um, uh, some forensics before you get a scene of crime. So um, uh, the, the best projects need a period of calm, um, uh, reflection, intense uh, archive gathering, research, building up the model so that the whole team, uh, before they put pen to paper, have a very informed uh, basis to what's easy to achieve, what's not easy to achieve. Because once the pen's put to paper, it's always very hard for everyone to row back. Uh, once a competition scheme is, is, is kind of put forward um, or, 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 the, or the initial sketch is there. So I think um, really a, a different approach to projects where it's, it's kind of scientific led, it's research led uh, from the start, um, which is really a different way to how a project might be set up right at the beginning. And I, th I think that the, the final thing is really that um, clients uh, need to make informed decisions. Most of the best clients now, they want to do the right thing, um, but they need engineering justification to, to back that decision. Um, so really very early on in a project, we need to explain and help them, uh, guide them through what the options are. And then throughout the whole project, to so every meeting, the embodied carbon should be reported against and why it's gone up and why it's gone down. Um, so th this informed decision uh, making action can, can work. For longer term sustainability, you've suggested that a carbon building tax is uh, really the only way to ensure that we deliver more sustainable buildings over the longer term. How, how would that work? Yeah, so I, I think the traditional uh, and current approach to, to most commercial buildings is that um, uh, the, sort of the site is bought, you get planning, uh, you build it, uh, you let it, and you sell it. 
Um, so there, there really is um, very little incentive uh, for a developer to embed flexibility into a, into a building design for something that might happen in five, 10, 20 years. Um, uh, you know, and we, what we want is a building to have a long, adventurous and varied life um, without a cost on the environment. Um, and we, so for that, we need a truly sustainable uh, approach so that commercial value uh, can support the ethical standpoint that the developers want to do. So what, what I mean by all this is that um, a building should have, uh, you know, how do you, how do you put a value to that? I think a building should have a lifelong tax uh, measured annually, whereby everything you do to that building during that year uh, is recorded. And, um, you know, there's a penalty you pay if you have to completely remodel the building 10 years down the line. Um, so ergo, uh, there's, there's a value to actually building in flexibility. So at the point of sale of the building, when a team are doing their due diligence, they'll look at, uh, okay, what's the grid like? Just how flexible is this in 10, 15 years to turn into a different use um, or to add to the building? Um, and you'll also, so you'll capture that medium to longer term change and the value of it, uh, encouraging developers to build like that now, but you'll also penalize the endless fit out industry. Uh, which has a huge carbon cost uh, and maybe that will still happen but that might then encourage it to happen in a more of a circular economy where floor tiles for example which are currently trash because they don't have a warranty uh, go into stockyards and uh, you can offset uh, any potential tax against that so I think we need where, where you don't have an owner occupier model we need a way uh, where you can incentivize true philosophical long-term uh, sustainable development beyond uh, Brian and all the other measures which really stop on practical completion and embodied energy. Great. So uh, your firm is uh, HTS is, is a champion of the NLA's zero carbon program. So what would you like to see NLA doing to help deliver more sustainable development in the future? Um, I think bringing uh, I keep saying true uh, sustainability, but this, this original philosophy to, to right to the forefront of the agenda again. Um, um, you know, within the industry and within planning authorities, uh, get the discussion uh, going and make sure it's it's not a service; it's something that runs for everything. Argue for for taller buildings, not towers, but more height, floor to floor, which is going to make buildings taller. Uh, if we want efficient. Uh, uh, lower carbon structures, we need more depth to get those uh, structures in. We need more floor to ceiling height to make more buildings flexible uh, further down the future. Another thing that changes along with recoring, we're finding a lot, is building floor levels um, aren't at the right height, so make buildings more adaptable to go up and down. Um, argue against approaches such as facade retention, uh, if the carbon cost outweighs any perceived benefit to the, the historical streetscape, and uh, promote retention. And I think um, we need uh, the scientists and the engineers uh, alongside the political arguments at pre-app stage. So we need to be providing, and we are now, uh, the design teams and the planning consultants with these very strong arguments at pre-app. And, and councils and planning authorities want to listen. They want to do the right thing as well. But they need the information for that. Um, I think helping uh, recognise what long life loose fit means over a 60-year period uh, so not awarding a building uh, the year it completes, but awarding a building 10 or 20 years down the line, uh, looking at how it's fared, how, how, how adaptable has it been. We work on many buildings that are 20 or 30 years old. Um, you know, there needs to be a lifetime achievement award, um, which looks back at how, how, it's, how it's worked. And I, so I, I think really the solution to climate change is, uh, has to be a collaborative approach and uh, there has to be a shared ambition. Um, I mean, it starts with the engineering, but everything else, I think, uh, will follow through from that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your support for NLA's programme. And uh, uh, it would be nice sometime to also talk about the wonderful improvements that are happening to London for cycling infrastructure at the moment as a result of COVID-19, which is also improving uh, London's sustainability as a city. Mark, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thanks very much.